So on the Boswell side of things, uh, welcome. Today is day 5,201 that Boswell's been in business. And we are pleased to welcome Leila Slamani for this virtual conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron Lewinow of Alliance Francaise de Milwaukee, our wonderful co-sponsor for some official introducing and wonderful conversation. I'm gonna disappear. That's it for Boswell for a little while. Thanks for being here. Everybody. Thank you. Um, so welcome, bienvenue. Leila Slimani is the best-selling author of Chanson Douce, or The Perfect Nanny, for which she became the first Moroccan woman to win France's most prestigious literary prize, the Goncourt, in 2016. Her other books include Adele, Sex and Lies, and The Country of Others, and of course, Watch Us Dance, which are the first and second parts of a trilogy of novels based on her family history that trace the evolution of Moroccan society. Slimani is French President Emmanuel Macron's personal representative for the promotion of the French language and culture and is the chair of the jury for the 2023 International Booker Prize. She is a formal, former journalist with Jeune Afrique. Born in Rabat, Morocco, she divides her time between France and Portugal. So merci encore, Leila, for being here with us. We're so happy. Um, to begin, if you could briefly summarize Watch Us Dance or the arc of your trilogy and do a brief reading if you'd like to. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I would say that the trilogy is the, the story of a, of a family, of a Moroccan, half Moroccan, half French family. The first installment, The Country of Other, tells the story of uh, Amin and Mathilde. Mathilde is a woman from Alsace, so the northeast of France, who meets a young soldier from Morocco during the war. And she fell crazy in love with him. And she decides to go with him to Morocco, more specifically to, to Meknes, and to have a farm with, with him and try to make a life and to build a, a family. They have two children, Aisha and Selim, during the time of colonization. So it's a very difficult time for them because as a mixed race family, they are rejected by both sides. And so the second part, Watch Us Dance, is set in the, the 60s, at the end of the 60s, and more focused on the children, on uh, Selim, uh, Selim and, and Aisha, and their own destiny in this Morocco that is uh, independent Morocco, but at the same time threatened by repression and by violence. Great. Um, and would you like to read a page or two or uh, to be honest I don't have my book oh. with me, so <laughs> no, no problem it. <laughs> um so this book is is based somewhat on your family's life I I'm sure you get asked this often but why is it important for you to write about your family history and what challenges does it present I don't know if it was important I wouldn't I wouldn't put it like that um I was always, as a child, I was fascinated by the couple of my grandparents because my grandmother, she she, she lived in, in Meknes in Morocco and she took a good care of, of me and my sisters. So I spent a lot of time with her and she was a fascinating woman because she was very tall. She was blonde with green eyes. At the same time, she spoke perfectly Arabic and Berber and she was a Muslim. And at the same time, she had this Alsatian accent and she would tell me so many stories about when she was young, about my grandfather and how they fell in love and all that. So I think that uh, as a little girl and then as a writer, I've always kn knew that there was something, yeah, something magic and something very, that I could use for a novel. I mean, with the story of my, my grandparents, but you know, I think that this trilogy is not so much about my family or, I mean, it's not, it's very fictional. It's not totally true. So I, I invent, I imagine, and the character of Mathilde is not exactly my grandmother, nor is Aisha my mother. So uh, what was important for me was not so much to say something about my family. It was to say something about Morocco and more specifically about growing up in a country like Morocco, who used to be a colonized country, who that is a country from the south, 
but at the same time is very connected to Europe and to the West, very influenced by the Western uh, culture, but at the same time, a country very proud of its own tradition. And I thought it was very, for me, it was interesting, but I think also that for the Western readers, it's interesting to try to understand that people who come from Africa don't come from another planet, they come from the same planet and the, their story is very highly connected to the story of other people. And when you're um, basing a story on some real events, how do you um, negotiate the line between fiction and nonfiction? Uh, you mean historical event or like, yeah. Yes. When it comes to historical events, what I do is that I read a lot. I have a lot, a lot of documentation. I really try to know everything I can know about the period of time I'm dealing with. But then I think that the challenge is to learn a lot and then to forget a lot. Because um, I think that when you write a novel, the point is not to give a lot and a lot and a lot of information to your reader. It's to make him feel something, an atmosphere, a certain tension. Um, I don't want to feed my, my, my readers with too many information. And also, I'm trying always to write at the same level of my characters. I don't want to write with more information than they have. I think that what I try to do also is to understand how people understand their own time, their own present. The fact that actually very often we don't understand the world we are living in. We will need time to understand it and a certain distance. And um, probably in 40 years or 50 years, people will say that we, our generation, we didn't understand anything to to the times we are living. So I think that's something I'm trying to write about, this sort of gap, this, yeah, between us as individual with our aspiration, our dreams, and what's around us and history. And I mean, yeah. Well, I um, have to tell you, we were just, we just led a group from the Alliance Francaise um, to Morocco in March. Um, and it was my first time there and you, really captured the atmosphere and environment very beautifully. We went all over and it's just such a diverse um, and complicated country. So that was, it was nice to revisit it through reading. Um, so you've written such a variety of books. I wonder um, where does a book begin for you? And I know you've also written as a journalist. So does the writing you're doing now or the writing life differ a lot from before? Yes, yes, very much. I think the I define myself as a novelist. I think that really my, yeah, my passion, my vocation, what I want to do, what I think I, yeah, I can do is is fiction. What I like is imagination, uh, but it's very difficult, very, very difficult. And uh, to be honest, the more you write and the more difficult it is because you are less innocent and more ambitious. So it's very, yeah, it's, it's tricky, it's hard, but, uh, I think when it comes to fiction, to fiction, everything begins with a character, or one or two characters. You you imagine them, how they interact, their personality, where they live, and then a whole story can can begin. But for me, it's yeah, it always begins with a character and also with a sort of idea, but a very confused and very abstract idea. I have something in my mind that I'm trying to understand. It's It always begins with a question, I think, with something that I don't understand, something that, yeah, that, that looks weird for me and I'm trying to, in a way, to investigate through the life of my characters. Um, you write and speak often about domination and liberation. You've said, I think I'm always writing about women, domination, violence. My obsession is freedom. How can we be free and at the same time link to one another as a wife, as a mother, and try to stay as an individual? I also write a lot about disillusionment. Is writing a freeing act for you? Not at all. No, absolutely not. No, I don't think so. Um, it can be some time for an hour or two but uh it's also it's also an alienation it's also a burden 
you know, I think about writing all the time. I wake up in the morning and I think that I have to write and uh, I go to sleep at night and I think that I didn't write enough and that maybe tomorrow I won't have any kind of inspiration. And so I spend like, when I'm writing, I spend 10 hours per day in my office alone writing and writing. And uh, even if, if I have a certain feeling of being free because I can say whatever I want alone in my in my office in front of my computer there is this there is this this feeling yes of being free to to express myself and to say whatever I want but at the same time there is also this feeling of being uh, my own tyrant of being a slave to myself and um, and not having yeah something else than writing this is my only obsession Um, so in these next few questions, I just wanted to pull out some of my favorite lines from Watch Us Dance and ask you about them. Um, you write, no, there had not been a revolution, only a change in the atmosphere, a reticence, an illusion of harmony and equality. Skipping ahead a little bit, it appeared that colonization had never been anything more than a misunderstanding, a faux pas that the French now repented and the Moroccans pretended to forget. Your characters are trying to figure out their own identities um, at the same time as a country, it seems social, political, um, and otherwise. Could you talk about this a little bit? And um, you mentioned this before, but do you see this more as a story of a family or of a country or both? Both, both, I think. But, you know, I think that a, actually a family is like a country. Uh, a family has her powerful people, weak people. In a family, there is always the one who dominates and the one who are dominated. There are rules in a family. There, there is also a specific language. Each family has their own way of talking and their own words and their own nicknames. So a family is, is very much like, like a country, I think. And um, there is also, you know, the, the frontiers. When you enter into a new family, you can feel that, that it's a new territory and you are entering this new territory and you have to learn the, the rules and how it works. And it's not always, always easy. So, yeah, about the, 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 the sentence you just, uh, you just read, I think that um, what I wanted to show is that all colonization are not the same. You know, in France, there is this vision that uh, there is the importance of the war of Algeria. So many people in France have like a very uh, unique vision of colonization, but every country experienced colonization in a different way. Uh, Tunisia is not Morocco, it's not Senegal, it's not Algeria, each, each country, has also the right to claim for its singularity, I mean, in terms of, of history. So that's what I wanted to show. What was interesting in Morocco is that even if colonization uh, was going with a certain race issue and with the despise for uh, Arab people and the idea that French people belong to a uh, higher or more prestigious race than, than Arabs. At the end, what is interesting is that people forgot completely about this question of race. And what was important was a question of class, of social class, because the elite from Morocco and the elite from France, they, they became very good friends and they understood that they, they could do a lot of things uh, thanks to colonization, that they could continue to collaborate, to make money, to uh, travel, to learn the same language. So that's what I wanted to, to show is that at the end, you know, uh, the, the Moroccan bourgeois, bourgeoisie, the Moroccan elite, they in a way they imitate the, the behavior of the colonizers and they had exactly the same despise and the same violence towards the people, the Moroccan people, than the colonists had before, before them. So that was this ambiguity, that this subtlety that I try to, to show in this extract. Um, and another thing I, I loved about this book is hearing Mathilde and Selma's thoughts, especially about men and womanhood throughout. They constantly highlighted it. I'll just 
read a little bit um, from Mathilde. What you call love is actually work. Were women really so filled with affection and kindness that they could spend an entire lifetime, yes, an entire lifetime taking care of others? When Mathilde thought about this, it made her almost enraged. There was something wrong here, a trap into which she had fallen, but whose name she could not remember. And then later, Selma says, um, women thought Selma, or thinks, are like those countries devastated by foreign armies, the earth scorched, the inhabitants forced to forget their own language, their own gods. Could you talk a bit about these characters and their worldviews? Yeah, I think that Mathilde, like Selma, they feel that um, becoming an adult and becoming a wife, becoming a woman who has interaction with men, that in the journey, they lost a lot of things. They lost their freedom. They lost their illusions. And more than that, I think that for Mathilde, she understands also that um, her husband, when she when she works for him and when she works for the children, when she does all the things she does uh, for, for the family, for him, it's just normal. It's just natural because for him, women, women do that because they love, because they are full of love and that uh, uh, women are only made of affection and that they need to give this affection to, uh, to other people. So I think that Selma, like Mathilde, they they are conscious at a certain point in their life that there is a big misunderstanding between men and women. And uh, there is a big misunderstanding about what women are waiting uh, from life and about their goals and about their desire that no, of course, they are not just uh, a, a, like a big, big ball of affection. They are not just made to sacrifice for others or to give. And uh, when she says, when Selma thinks that it's um, like a country devastated by others, when you, well, I think the most important is a place where you forget about your own language and your own gods. Because I think when you are a little girl, when you are younger, um, as a woman, you have your own dreams, you have your own way to to deal with the world and to feel the experiences. And the more you experience the domination and the more people try to make of you a good woman or the kind of woman they want you to be you lose your language you lose your gods you lose what makes you singular to become a woman a woman but in the eyes of those who want you to be that so yeah it's um as you were saying before that i i, I write a lot about disillusion but it's yeah it's about that disappointment disillusion the fact that life uh, is absolutely not what they thought it would be and um jumping to different characters the men uh, amin and murad um murad says uh, he knew that in this country, no one is ever alone. He wanted to warn Amin, there's always someone who knows what you've been doing. Um, was that your experience growing up in Morocco or how would you compare it to your time living in France? Yes, absolutely. It was my experience for many reasons. The first one is that I was raised during the reign of uh, Hassan II. So during the, the years of, uh, of repression and it was a uh, Neta policier, so the police was everywhere, and everyone was uh, under surveillance. And we we knew it. We knew that people would listen to the phone. That uh, if you would go to a cafe or anywhere, there was always someone spying on, on you. And uh, you know that's the whole organization in 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 Morocco at that time. I mean, people in the street who were taking care of cars the woman who would work at home, anyone was here also to listen and report. So um, yes, I knew that. But there is also the fact that we come from a culture and a tradition that is based on community and on the on the group. The idea of the individual doesn't exist in a country like Morocco. You can't claim like individual rights. You have always to think about yourself uh, in terms of the interaction with the group. That's why it's so difficult for people who are different to live in a country like Morocco. If, if it's, like it can be in terms of sexual orientation, but even in terms of, yeah, of personality. If a woman is very like Selma, very different and she doesn't want to get married and she's free, she's 
going to be marginalized because people consider that uh, she's sh shaming the group, she's shaming her family. She's... So the most important thing is always the group, the fact that you belong to a group. There are good, good things in that or good faces of that, that there is a lot of solidarity in Morocco. You will never... You will never find someone that has nothing to eat who is completely alone. There is always, at a certain point, uh, someone who is going to, to help. So there is a solidarity. We believe really in solidarity in the group. But at the same time, the idea of loneliness, the idea of doing something without no one looking at it, without no one judging it, it's very difficult. Um, so switching gears a little bit with some questions from our school director, who is French and in France. Um, how did you decide to be an ambassador for the French language and to become involved as a representative of the, of the Francophone world? You know, I was raised, as I said, in Morocco, and my parents used to speak in, with me and my sisters in, in French. So we were a Francophone and Francophile family. And I was at the, uh, I studied in French school and then I came to France. So my relationship to French language is quite obvious. That's my language. That's my maternal language. And um, I've always been very angry and very outraged when the people in Morocco or in other places would like accuse me of speaking French and be betraying my culture by speaking French, speaking the language of the colonists and blah, blah. And I've always thought that it was totally ridiculous and, and stupid. First of all, because I didn't experience colonization. So I'm not a victim, I mean, of colonization. And, and then because my country, Morocco, is a multilingual country, but it, it has always been because we speak Berber, we speak Arabic, we speak Spanish, we speak uh, Hassani, we speak multiple languages. And the truth is, I think it's uh, an advantage and a great asset for the next generation to be to live in a country where you you can speak multiple languages. So um, I've always thought that it was important to make a difference or to separate a language from ideology. Of course, people killed in French and they did also good things in French, but I think we could say the same of every language. And, um, you know, Arabic, they, Arabic came to Morocco also because of colonization, because the Arab tribes came to Morocco in the ninth century and they colonized Morocco. But I mean, that's the story of humanity and that's the story of, of languages. But um, I really believe that the more, the more language we speak and the more human we are, and um, I really believe that French language is not French anymore. French language is Moroccan, French language is Senegalese, is Haitian, is from Guyana, and from many countries in, in the world. And we, from those places in the world, we need to say that and to, yeah, and to be proud of that. Um, are there specific lessons you feel like you've taken from this, from your position as a representative of the world of francophonie or mm. what has the experience been like um i would say that uh yeah it's more and more difficult uh i mean to defend multiculturalism and multilingualism because people are very uh i feel that this the society right now in many places in the world People are very centered on themselves and on, uh, and there, there is also a very pragmatic vision of, of language. I need to learn something that will be immediately useful. And I think it's something that we all need to say is that French language is a very useful language. It's a language that will help you find a job, that will help you when you travel. It's not just language to speak about literature or uh, macaron. It's a very concrete and important language also to, to make a career and to have a job. So I think that's maybe the thing we need to focus more on. Um, and you, you say that French is a language of desire and that we must revive contemporary interest in the Francophone world. Um, how you spoke a little bit about this, but are there other ways in which you think the French language can reach and attract new audiences? For example, young people, which of course we're always trying to do at the Alliance as well, try to get 
people who have never taken another language um, take French. You know, I think that one of the arguments is probably to tell them that when you learn French, you don't learn only a, a language to go to France, but it's also a language that will help you if you want to work or invest or, I don't know, do business in Africa, but also in a certain part of the Caribbean or South America or a certain part of Asia. So I think that it's very, very important to emphasize the fact that it's a yeah, worldly language. It, we speak French in many, many places in, in the world. So I invite people to learn this language to discover Morocco or, yeah, as I said, or Senegal or many other countries. And do you always write in French? Yes. Um, last question from Arnaud. Um, in his speech in 2018, the French to the French Academy, the president of the Republic emphasized multilingualism. Why is multilingualism one of the major challenges facing French language internationally, do you think? Because the only country, the only francophone country that is not multilingual is France. All the other francophone countries are multilingual, from Switzerland to Belgium to Tunisia to uh, African countries like Côte d'Ivoire or Benin or Senegal. So French is coexisting with other language, which is at the same time beautiful and, and great, but also challenging because it means that the, the education for children has also to work with that and educate children in many languages. So yes, it's a challenge, but at the same time, I'm pretty convinced that it's a an asset and uh, that is an advantage for the francophone people is that they are able to speak multiple languages. Sure. Um, so as a, I'm a writer as well, I always love to write about place. I, your, um, a lot of your novels in Meknes, but also in uh, Swira and, and other places. Could you talk a little bit about the, the setting of your book? Yeah, I chose cities and places that I love first, that I love, that um, fascinates me, that left uh, strong memories on, on me, sensual memories, I mean, in terms of of colors, of smells, of, yeah, very sensual experience I, I had over there. Um, the city of Isawira is very important for me. I spent a lot of time there, especially with friends, and um, I love the... I love the, the atmosphere of the of the city because of the wind, because of the the feeling you have of being at the end of nowhere, but also because of the the way the people there uh, behave. They are very free, very open minded. They have always wake, welcomed strangers from all over the world. They are yeah, they don't care about what you do, and uh, they they don't look at you, they don't judge you, and that's something that I really really like in this city and Meknes is my my mother's uh native city so I've spent a lot of time there it's um it used to be a very beautiful city that's what my grandmother told me and it's a very important city in the the history of Morocco because it was founded by our one of our greatest king who was a the king at the same time of Louis XIV uh, in, in France, and he built a very beautiful uh, castles and many, many old buildings in, in Meknes that you can still visit now. So yeah, it's a very, very important city, in, I mean, in our history and in our culture. Is it easy for you to put yourself back in the mindset to be able to write about Morocco, having left a while ago? Do you still very feel very close to it or...? Yes, it's. I think it's easy when I write. Yes, it's easy to go back there and to, yeah, to to imagine and to remember. Yeah, it's quite easy. I think. Um, and if there are any other writers out there, what advice would you give to a young writer? To write. That's the only <laughs> advice I can give you. Uh, there is no other solution to become a writer than to write, to write, and to write all the time until. You find your own voice and you find uh, yeah, what you have to say. But um, I think the only advice is to, to, to write and to work and not to think about uh, your mother 
and not to think about Marcel Proust. There are the two things you should never think about when you write. Um, and Anne is about to come in with her questions. My last one is, um, which authors do you admire the most? Um, admiration, um, I would say, I admire Toni Morrison very much. I admire um, the poet, the Russian Ukrainian poet, Anna Akhmatova, Svetlana Alexievich, uh, I admire her very much. Uh, I admire Philip Roth. Yeah, I think that's the writer that I admire the most. All favorites. Well, great. Um, Anne, if you have a question or two in French and want to translate them <laughs> or, or just keep it in French. <laughs> Merci encore de, de venir jusqu'à chez nous. Uh, bien sûr par Zoom. Et uh, en fait, um, uh, Aaron a posé beaucoup de questions que j'avais déjà écrites, mais une des questions que, que j'ai pour vous, c'est selon vous, um, quels sont les pays uh, d'où vient la littérature francophone la plus intéressante en ce moment, ou quelles régions du, du monde? Euh, moi, j'ai toujours du mal à établir des hiérarchies de qu'est-ce qui est intéressant, qu'est-ce qui ne l'est pas. C'est... C'est d'abord, vous savez, c'est le, le lecteur hein, qui fait l'intérêt du livre aussi. Donc, quand un livre n'est pas intéressant, il faut aussi se poser des questions sur soi-même. Mais je dirais, que, je dirais que le continent africain est un continent sur lequel euh, il y a, dans lequel aujourd'hui il y a vraiment une créativité littéraire euh, passionnante. Alors, pas forcément d'ailleurs que issue du monde francophone, euh, anglophone aussi. Euh, le Sénégal, bien sûr, avec euh, quelqu'un comme Mohamed Mbougarsa. Euh, Sami Tchak, qui est un écrivain du Togo, euh, Ali Zamir, qui est un écrivain des Comores. Il y a des écrivains passionnants en Algérie, comme, comme Kamel Daoud. Euh, donc euh, oui, je dirais que c'est quand même sur le continent africain que se passent les choses les plus intéressantes. Très bien. Et est-ce que vous êtes une, une fan de, des écrivains francophones d'Haïti, Martinique Énormément, énormément, énormément. Parce que je trouve qu'ils ont une langue... Euh, vraiment à part, et puis hein, que, oui, c'est ça quelque chose, de, une poésie qu'on qu ne trouve nulle part ailleurs. Très bien. Et euh, dans votre rôle euh, pour promouvoir la francophonie en France, est-ce que vous avez des priorités euh, en ce moment? Ou bah, des... Une des priorités pour promouvoir la francophonie en France, en tout cas, c'est tout simple, c'est d'abord l'accès à la lecture, et quand je dis l'accès à la lecture, c'est euh, dans son dans son sens le plus, le plus concret, le plus basique, c'est-à-dire d'abord, par exemple, la lutte contre l'illettrisme, puisqu'il y a un million et demi de Français qui ne savent pas lire et écrire. Donc, ça, c'est un, un dossier qui est prioritaire. Oui. Très bien. Um, et, et, et comme Erin, je, je viens de passer dix uh, jours au Maroc, j'ai adoré, mais j'ai surtout adoré parce que j'avais passé deux ans euh, au Maroc, dans un petit village du Moyen Atlas. Donc, c'est un pays qui m'est vraiment très, très proche du cœur et, et que je découvre euh, à chaque fois que je redécouvre des choses encore plus, plus magnifiques à chaque fois que, que j'y vais. Et, euh, et je suis un, un peu aussi euh, fascinée par euh, les contes euh, euh, que j'ai euh, découvert par Paul Bowles, les contes et les, tout, toute la magie dans, dans ces contes traditionnels du Maroc qui sont magnifiques. Eh ben, ça me fait très plaisir. Merci. Euh, et puis, je suis toujours étonnée du, de la capaci capacité de, de langage que, que presque tous les Marocains parlent deux, trois, quatre, cinq langues. Ah oui, oui, c'est vraiment vrai. euh, impressionnant comme, euh, comme américaine. C'est vrai. Right. Those were my questions. Uh, I don't know. If we, we have some in the chat here. Um, well, someone is asking, I think in French, do you have a, a publication date for someone's very excited for volume three? For mm -hmm. your last. <laughs> do you know? No. When? No, nope. I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, another question was there anything you took out of the book? I assume she means that watch us dance that you wish you kept in. 
What do you mean? I don't understand the question. I'm, I'm assuming this is not my question, but that she means in, in the in the editing process or um, was, oh, no, maybe was an earlier draft a lot different? No, no, not really. No, no, it's uh, quite the same as the one I, I wrote. No, no, no much editing. Do you um, tend to write your book straight through or do you have a different process? No, I write. No, it, it depends. It depends on the book. But for those those ones, it was quite difficult. So you, I write and then I stop a little bit and then I write another part. Um, keep going here. Um, what question did you seek to answer in Chanson Douce? Is it possible to be a mother and to work at the same time? Um, just going down the line here. Are your novels uh, well read and accepted well in Morocco? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. People love my books in Morocco. Um, and what? Why do you say not to think about Proust or one's mother in order to be a writer? Because if you think about your mother, you're going to be afraid of seeing things that your mother won't like. And if you think of Marcel Proust, you will stop writing because after Marcel Proust, why bother writing? So th th those are two things that can inhibit you. <laughs> it's a, a question of inhibition. Um, and along those lines is your, um, does your um, family, uh, react to your books a lot I mean this family history touches a lot of people do they do do they view it as fiction no you know I'm very lucky because they are all dead so there there is no no reaction for for a writer it's very good um and and I don't know if you see do you want to read one in French from Terry and I could skip to the. Oops, you're muted. Où est-ce que je peux obtenir votre nouveau livre en français? Y a-t-il une version où la lecture est enregistrée à haute voix par vous-même? Pas par moi-même, mais oui, il y a un audio livre qui existe. Oui, oui, ça c'est sûr, mais c'est pas moi qui l'ai enregistré, c'est une actrice. Il est très beau. Super. Um, one. One more question from me. I read in one interview that you had um, explored being an actress at one point. Do you, is there a reason why you left that? And do you feel like there's crossover with being a writer? No, because I was very, very, very bad. That's why I, I stopped. I had absolutely no talents. Um, I don't know if there is any link with writing, but... Uh, no, I enjoyed um, doing it, but it was more uh, like something that had to do with my ego. It was more a narcissistic uh, impulse that's, than something else. So, no, I was not very gifted for that. And one last question from the chat here. Um, how do you enjoy your role working with Macron? With Macron and writers, with writers, arts and literature. Yeah, I answered before. I enjoy it. Uh, you know, I think it's it's important. I'm trying to do to do my best. Great. Um, and one last one. I know you have something else to get to. I um, what what are you reading now, if anything? And do you read while you're writing? Yes, I am. I am writing the. Uh, I am reading. Sorry, I'm reading the autobiography of uh, Edouard Said, uh, the writer of the Orientalist. And it's very interesting. And I think it's one last question that was: Do you see your book as a movie? Yes, it will be a movie. Oh, it's quite exciting. <laughs> um, well, I'm here, Chris, once again, signing off for Boswell and everyone. Uh, merci beaucoup, of course, to yes. Alain Francais for uh, co-hosting, uh, to Aaron and Anne for your insightful, excellent questions. And Leila, of course, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It has been absolutely fantastic. Um,
from Boswell, we wouldn't have a bookstore without you. So thank you, all of you for tuning in today. Um, have a great afternoon. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you so much.